Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to have a completely full room to speak to today. Um, in fact, we were somewhat oversubscribed, but it seems to have worked out perfectly um, <laughs> in terms of being totally full. I'm just really pleased that so many of you have joined us, some coming from as far as Perth and Adelaide and quite a number here from Canberra. Um, to join us for the launch. But no one's come as far as our two guests, John Quackenbush and Andrew Morris. John is only here for 27 hours. Um, he's, uh, he arrived here this morning, um, much nail-biting around flights, um, but he's here. But we just thank him so much for coming so far, um, really just to, to help us launch the centre. Um, I'm particularly pleased that I get to speak before both of these two. Um, they're sort of rock stars of the big, big data in health uh, field. Um, I'm not, not yet, but um, <laughs> as I was saying, um, I can steal their thunder, but they can't steal mine. So, <laughs> um, so I'm really here just to give a brief introduction to the centre. Um, and really the centre has five key objectives, and I'll just go through each one of those really quite briefly. The first one, and I think it was mentioned by the Minister, is really to be a sort of a hub for big data research in health in Australia. Currently there's no sort of single focus for this type of work. We've got lots of really good research groups, most of them are small to medium sized. They're spread across a whole range of institutions, different jurisdictions, even within institutions like UNSW across multiple faculties, schools and centres. Um, but as a result of that, there's actually quite a lack of critical mass in this area. A lot of the research is done on a very project-by-project project basis. So a grant is awarded, a project is done. The learnings from that project aren't necessarily generalised beyond that project. And so it has been really a cottage industry approach, which is a shame given that Australia has, you know, probably five to ten years ago was in a really good position to probably be a world leader um, in this area. We just up until now haven't really totally got our act together in terms of moving to an industrial scale approach. Um, and we really need that because in the big data world, uh, a huge amount of the time, the research time actually goes on just getting the approvals to get the data, um, obtaining the data, and then sort of wrangling the data to make it in some way useful for research. Um, and really there is an imperative that we make the maximum use of these data. They're actually publicly funded. Um, they're we contribute our information, um, you contribute your taxpayer dollar to collecting the data and to paying for the research. So there's a real imperative that we move to a situation where we're making the most public good out of these data. And to do that, I think it's going to be critical that researchers from across institutions come together to work with them. And so that's really what the centre is about. It's about developing and sharing sort of industrial strength approaches to big data research. Um, of trying to bring together people from not only across UNSW, but other institutions in Australia and internationally. So part of being a hub, we are hoping to develop a sort of a visiting scholar program. And we've also already kicked off a seminar series. So John very kindly gave our first uh, seminar this morning and Andrew is giving one on Wednesday. And we've also got some plans in training, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So, our next function is really to be a research leader. Obviously, that's one of our aspirations. We already have a strong research program. We've got only 12 staff currently, but they're working on grants that are funded through a whole range of sources, including a National Health and Medical Research Council, National Heart Foundation, and a range of other funding partners. I think the sort of topics that we're, we address have already been mentioned, but they are as diverse as the health and development of Aboriginal children, measuring health system performance, safety of medications during pregnancy. Um, we're actually in the process of recruiting further staff, and it's, it's, I can't sort of announce the results of that process other than that. Um, I am delighted to be able to say that um, Dr Georgina Chambers, she's not here today, she's interstate, an internationally recognised expert in perinatal health services research and health economics is going to join us. So Georgina and her team, um, which include the National Perinatal Epidemiology and Statistics Unit, will be moving across to join the centre over the next few months. And with other recruitment that's planned, we do expect we'll have around 40 researchers by the end of this year. Um, obviously, this rapid increase in our size and expansion, the sort of skill base and topic areas that we cover, will open up a lot of um, exciting possibilities for more research. 
already we're forging new collaborations with people, many of whom are in the room, from um, other groups across the UNSW, including the School of Public Health and Community Medicine, Kirby Institute, Black Dog Institute, National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, and faculties of computing and engineering, maths and stats, and law. Um, and of course, we intend to build on the current grant success of our team. Anyone who's a researcher here will know how difficult that currently is. That's going to mean writing an awful lot of grant applications. Um, <laughs> um, but collaboration with like-minded researchers, both nationally and internationally, will be a feature of the grant applications that we write. And indeed, we've got currently one under review that um, has 10 chief investigators from nine different institutions in five different countries. So um, we're really hoping that that one gets up. Um, I couldn't do a talk without quickly um, give, so presenting some research results. And I think Holger Moller, one of our PhD students, this is his work, he is here somewhere. Um, he's investigating injury in Aboriginal children. People often don't think of uh, Aboriginal health and big data as it being sort of congruent topics, but in fact they are. Um, because big data are obviously very powerful for studying small population groups where you just can't get enough numbers any other way. And so we've got a whole of population data here for a seven year period. And this actually enables us to have enough numbers to try to tease out um, the different influences of being Aboriginal, of living in a, in a rural area, and of having low socioeconomic status. And if you just look at these results, the, um, basically these are broken down by the dip various different injury <coughs> mechanisms. The lighter blue ones are the non-Aboriginal children, darker ones are Aboriginal. I guess the important things to note are that overall, you know, there is a disparity. Aboriginal children have higher rates of unintentional injury regardless of whether they're their level of disadvantage and regardless of where they live, whether that be urban or rural. But the, there is a difference according to the different injury types. And so it's particularly marked for transport injury, burns injury and poisoning, you know, less marked for something like fall injury. So already this research is pointing to policy responses, including the need for targeted Aboriginal child seat, car seat programs, but not only in rural areas, also in urban areas. Um, the only way to be a sort of research leader in the health big data domain is actually to be a good research partner, um, not only by collaborating with other researchers, but also working in tandem with those who deliver our health services. Our research, our research will only make a difference if it answers questions that are worth answering and if there's some sort of pathway for translation into policy and practice. And we have uh, a large number of long-standing policy and practice research partners. I think most of them are actually represented here, um, including the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, New South Wales Ministry of Health, Health Direct Australia, Agency for Clinical Innovation, Bureau for Health Information, New South Wales Kids and Families, Families and Communities New South Wales, the National Health Performance Authority, Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council, and a range of New South Wales local health districts. All of those are actually current active uh, research partners. Obviously, we hope to further, and further strengthen those partnerships and build new ones. Something that I'm particularly keen on doing, though, is trying to uh, create some larger scale and longer term partnerships to try to overcome some of this project by project approach that we have that really is not a very efficient way to do research, it makes it very difficult to plan our human and other resources, um, and also makes it difficult to provide any form of uh, employment security for, for staff working in this area. So I'd be very uh, interested in discussing with any of the potential policy partners or current policy partners here ways that one could build some of these larger scale long-term partnership approaches. And again, just one other uh, piece of research findings. This is an example of our current partnership research with Health Direct Australia. I think there's multiple Health Direct people in the audience. Um, so here we're, we're working together with Health Direct Australia to evaluate the outcomes of their telephone helpline services. So we've linked records of more than 2 million calls to Health Direct to records of the subsequent emergency department and other health service use and also mortality of the callers. The main reason for doing this is to look at their compliance with advice and overall, actually this is the largest study of this topic that's ever been done worldwide, we're pleased to say. Um, overall, we've found that 67% of patients who are triaged by a nurse 
actually, and told to go to an emergency department immediately, do so. And 71% of those who are triaged by the After Hours GP helpline do so. And that is a result that's on par with or better than any of the international studies of this topic. But perhaps importantly, as this figure shows, those patients who are triaged by the health direct nurse, who are the blue ones, or the health direct GP, who are the green ones, the, green, the, the GP lines only a recently introduced service, um, actually are more likely than the overall population of emergency department patients who are the red ones to have an urgent disposition when they actually attend the ED and they're less likely to have the non-urgent disposition. And this strongly suggests that Health Direct is actually sort of sending the right patients to the emergency department, which was the whole reason for introducing the Health Direct helpline. So the project's ongoing, and we'd just really like to uh, express our thanks to our colleagues at Health Direct for embarking on the data linkage journey at a point when we had no idea what the findings were going to be. Um, we're a university, we'll be a training ground, um, but for my whole career, workforce shortages in biostatistics and bioinformatics, as well as data science more generally, have been grumbled about and have been described as being limiting factors in health research. Um, unfortunately, the era of big data only exacerbates this particular problem, and the field of big data is sort of resolving from individual disciplines, such as biostatistics, computer science, maths, epidemiology, into something that's more of a transdisciplinary melting pot, but the competencies that you need for this workforce aren't well defined and are not well catered for in current training. What's certain is that demand for big data enabled specialists and researchers is rapidly increasing, while supply of individuals with these skills is not. But in addition, many of the currently active researchers who are working in the field actually don't have any formal training in some of the core competencies that underpin it and have just sort of learnt on the job or as they go along. <coughs> The centre will play a role in tackling the problem, both through nurturing research of the future as part of our team, so honours and postgraduate students, but also developing and delivering training. And the first cap off the rank is a course that we're currently developing with colleagues from the School of Public Health and Community Medicine, which will be offered in summer school this year. And this is really a sort of a, almost an entry level course for people who are going to do research with big data focusing on core competencies in using and managing data. So things like legal and ethical frameworks, um, cleaning, checking, documenting, good programming, making sure your research is reproducible. The, the course will be offered both to internal master's students, but also to anyone here and any of your staff that you might like to, to send along as a, a non-award student. And then finally, um, our, our final objective is to promote public clinical and policy awareness of the benefits of research using big data. Um, as we all know, privacy is a source of great tension and anxiety in this field, and it's really important that we as researchers actually engage actively in this debate and work to help to shape the technical and policy responses. Um, I've done quite a bit of work with consumers, and consumers in general are totally surprised and shocked by how little use is made of their routinely collected data for research. Um, and a number of Australian consumer bodies, including the Consumers Health Forum, have actually been quite vocal advocates for better use of the data. Um, key messages that we as researchers need to emphasise are that the big data that we use are anonymised, aggregated, stored securely, and that there is no incentive for researchers to do anything other than to protect privacy. Um, our careers, our reputation and the integrity of our research all depend upon that. Recent work in New South Wales and nationally to streamline ethics review and to improve mechanisms for access to linked data are very encouraging, but a lot remains to be done to provide clear legal and policy frameworks for data custodians and agencies. Our role as a centre is to participate in this work as a partner, stakeholder and a beneficiary, um, not to just snipe from the sidelines about how bad everything is and how slow everything is. Um, we've already made a contribution through my work as a chair of the NHMRC's Data Reference Group, which has developed new national principles for accessing and using publicly funded data for research that are just about to be released. And our centre will hopefully play quite an active role in trying to get those disseminated and used. So that's all from me.